So about a year and a half ago, um, and for the third time in my life, I, I ceased to exist. I was having a small operation, and my brain was filling with anesthetic. And I remember sensations of blackness and coldness and falling apart. And then I was back, drowsy and disoriented, but definitely there. Now, when you come round from a deep sleep, you might be confused about the time or anxious for oversleeping, but there's always a basic sense of continuity of some time having passed, of a difference between then and now. Now, for those of you who've had general anesthesia, it's very different. I could have been under for five minutes, five hours, five years, or even 50 years. I just wasn't there. It was total oblivion. Anesthesia, it's a modern kind of magic. It turns people into objects, and then we hope back again into people. And in this process is one of the greatest remaining mysteries in science and in philosophy. How does consciousness happen? Now, somehow, within each of our brains, the combined activity of many tens of billions of neurons, each one a tiny biological machine, is giving rise to a conscious experience. Not just any conscious experience, your conscious experience right here and right now. How can this happen? Now, you'll sometimes hear that we know nothing about how the brain and the body give rise to consciousness, that there is this uncrossable explanatory chasm between your conscious lives and the physical world. Some people even say that, that consciousness is beyond the reach of science altogether. Stuart Sutherland, who was the founding professor of psychology at my own University of Sussex, just down the road, 1989, not so long ago, said this. He said, consciousness is a, a fascinating but elusive phenomenon. It's impossible to specify what it is, what it does, or why it evolved. Nothing worth reading has been written on it, which is pretty damning for, for a scientist. Um, and that might have been true then. It's certainly not true now. The last 25 years or so has seen an explosion of work in this, in this area. If you come to my lab, um, again, just down the road, you'll find scientists from, from all different disciplines, uh, and philosophers too, all of us trying to understand how consciousness happens and what happens when it goes wrong. And we're making good progress. The strategy that we take, anyway, is very simple. I'd like you to think about consciousness in the same way that we've come to think about life. Now, people once thought that life could never be explained by physics and chemistry, that life had to be more than mere mechanism. But we don't think that anymore. As biologists got on with the job of explaining the properties of living systems, metabolism, reproduction, and homeostasis, and all these things, in terms of physics and chemistry, the basic mystery of life itself started to fade away, and people didn't feel the need to propose any more magical solutions, like a, an elan vital or a spark of life. Life is magical, but there is nothing magic about life. Now, as with life, so with consciousness. Once we start to explain the properties of conscious experiences in terms of things happening in brains and bodies, the basic mystery of what consciousness is should start to fade away. Well, at least that's, that's the idea. So what are the properties of consciousness? What should a science of consciousness try to explain? Well, for today, very briefly, there are two kinds of things. There are experiences of the world around us. This fully immersive, panoramic, three-dimensional, multimodal inner universe that we all inhabit. And then there's conscious self, the specific experience of being you or being me. The experience of being the subject of experience. And this is probably the aspect of consciousness that we all cling to most tightly. So let's start with experiences of the world around us. How does the brain do that? Well, imagine being a brain. There you are, you're locked inside a bony skull. Uh, there's no sound inside the brain. There's no light either. And you're trying to figure out what's out there in the world. And all you've got to go on, stuck inside the skull, are noisy and ambiguous sensory signals, which are only indirectly related to things in the world, whatever they may be. So perception, figuring out what's there, has to be a process of informed guesswork in which these sensory signals are combined with the brain's prior beliefs or expectations about the way the world is to form its best guess of the causes of those sensory signals. Perception is the brain's best guess of what's out there in the world. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. Now, you may have seen these kinds of illusions before, but I'd like you to think about them in a slightly different way. This one's called Adelson's checkerboard. If you look at the two patches here, marked A and B, I'll just highlight them there, they should look to be different shades of grey. Does everybody see that, different shades of grey? Well, they are, of course, exactly the same shade, and I can show you that by putting up a second image and joining it together. It's just a continuous 
uh, patch of grey. If it's still not convincing, I'll just move the bar across, and you can see that it's one continuous um, grey colour. Take it away, and they look different again. So what's going on here is that the brain is using its prior knowledge built deep into the circuits of the visual cortex that a cast shadow dims the appearance of a surface. So we, the, we see B as lighter than it really is. You know, the, the visual system isn't supposed to be an accurate light meter. It's supposed to figure out what the causes of sensory signals are. Here's another example which shows just how quickly the brain can use new predictions to change conscious experience. Have a listen to this. Anybody understand that or figure out what that was? Have, a, have another listen. Now listen to this. I think Brexit is a really bad idea. <laughs> it's a theme from earlier. Um, now listen again to the first sound. I'm going to play exactly the same file. I think Brexit is a really bad idea. So I hope for most of you what previously had sounded just like some noisy whistles, you can now understand as, as words, as, as a sentence. Just once more. Okay, I won't, I won't do it again. I mean, what's remarkable here is that the sensory information coming into your brain hasn't changed at all. All that's changed is your brain's best guess of the cause of that information, and that changes what you consciously experience. Now, this puts the brain basis of perception in, in quite a new light. Instead of thinking of perception in terms of sensory signals coming from the outside world into the brain in this kind of bottom-up direction, it depends just as much, if not more, on perceptual predictions flowing in the opposite direction. The world we experience comes as much from the inside out as from the outside in. Here's one last example of perception as this generative constructive process. Here we've combined virtual reality with image processing to stimulate the effects of overly strong perceptual predictions on visual experience. Now in this video, which you'd normally experience through a, through a headset, the world, which in this case is the campus of Sussex University, has been transformed into a psychedelic playground. What we've done is process the footage with an algorithm based on Google's Deep Dream to simulate what would happen if the brain had very strong perceptual predictions to see dogs everywhere. And you can see this leads to some, I mean, this is a normal Tuesday afternoon uh, on, on campus. Um, it's very strange effects, and the kinds, it simulates the kinds of hallucinations that people report in altered states, various kinds of altered states, and also perhaps even in psychosis. So let's think about this for a second. If hallucinations are a kind of uncontrolled perception, then normal perception right here and right now is also a kind of hallucination, but it's a controlled hallucination in which the brain's predictions are continually reined in by sensory signals coming from the world. In fact, we're all hallucinating all the time. Right now, it's just that whenever we agree about our hallucinations, well, that's what we call reality. Now, it's one thing to realize that our experiences of the outside world are only indirectly related to an external reality. It's another thing altogether to turn that insight inwards and to grasp, however tenuously, that the basic background experience of being you or being me is also a fragile construction of the brain, another controlled hallucination which can and sometimes does disintegrate entirely. You know, for most of us, the experience of being a self is so familiar, so unified and so continuous that it's hard not to take it for granted, but we shouldn't take it for granted. In fact, there are many different ways we experience being a self. There's the experience of, of having a body and of being a body. There are experiences of seeing the world from a first-person perspective. There's the experience of intending to do things and being the cause of things that happen. When people talk about free will, this is often what they're talking about. And there's the experience of being a continuous and distinctive person over time with a particular name, built from a rich set of memories and social interactions. Now, psychiatrists and neurologists know very well that these different aspects of selfhood can come apart in different ways. So the basic background experience of being a person, being a self, is an experience which requires explanation, just like any other. Let's return to the bodily self. The how does the brain generate the experience of being and of having uh, a particular body? Well, the idea is just the same principles apply. The brain makes its best guess about what is and what is not part of its body. 
And there's a classic experiment you might have seen which, which illustrates this. It's called the rubber hand illusion. Unlike most experiments in neuroscience, you can do this one at home. All you need is a, is a kind of fake hand and a couple of paintbrushes. Um, in the rubber hand illusion, a person's real hand is hidden from sight and a fake rubber hand is placed in front of them. Then the real hand and the rubber hand are simultaneously stroked with a paintbrush while the person focuses their attention on the fake hand. And for most people, after a short time, this leads to the very uncanny feeling that the fake hand is, in fact, part of their body. And the idea is that this congruence between seeing touch and feeling touch on an object that looks like a hand and is roughly where a hand should be is enough evidence for the brain to make a best guess that the fake hand is, in fact, part of the body. Now, you can measure all kinds of clever things. <laughs> That's the well-controlled scientific way to test that it works. There's, there's plenty of other ways to do it, but it works. It's great to do it at science festivals and things like that, actually. Um, so the experience of what is our body is another kind of best guess. You can actually extend this to the whole body. In, at the British Science Festival a couple of weeks ago in, in Brighton, we set this this up. And this is called the body swap illusion. What you do here, it's very simple. You take two headsets with cameras on, you swap the feed, and then you have people shake hands with each other. And that provides the critical multi-sensory cue uh, that causes the brain to change its inference. And in this case, the experience is that you're somehow shaking, you're in somebody else's body shaking hands with yourself from the outside. So even where you are in space is just another part of what the brain makes best inference about the sensory signals that it gets. So that's what all these experiments collectively show, that the experience of what is our body is just another kind of controlled hallucination. Now that's not all. As well as experiencing our body as an object in the world from the outside, we also experience it from within. In fact, a great deal of neuronal real estate is devoted to sensory signals coming from inside the body that tell the brain about the internal physiological condition, what blood pressure levels are like, how the heart is doing, how the gut is doing. And this kind of perception, which we call interoception, is rather overlooked, but it's critically important because controlling, perceiving and controlling the internal state of the body, well, that's what keeps us alive, and that's actually the fundamental imperative, functional evolutionary imperative for having a brain in the first place to keep us alive. Now, here's another version of the, the rubber hand illusion. This is from our own lab at Sussex, and this is kind of augmented reality circa 2012, by the way, so it's a bit jerky. Um, here, people see a virtual reality version of their hand, augmented reality version of their hand, and you can just about see it. it's flashing red and back, either in time or out of time, with a person's heartbeat. And it turns out that when it's flashing in time with their heartbeat, people have a stronger sense that it's part of their body. So experiences of what is our body depend on perceptual predictions about signals coming from both outside and deep inside uh, the body. Conscious selfhood is a very deeply embodied phenomenon. Now, there's one last thing I want to draw your attention to. When I experience the world around me, I experience it in terms of objects, in terms of tables, chairs, people, and the spaces in between them. But my experience of the body from within isn't like that at all. I don't experience my internal organs as objects inhabiting various places. I don't experience them as objects. In fact, I don't really experience my insides much at all unless they're, they're going wrong somehow. And here, I think, is, is the key. Perception of the internal state of the body isn't about figuring out what's there. It's about control and regulation, keeping the important physiological quantities or values in our bodies within the tight bounds that are compatible with our survival. So when the brain uses predictions to figure out what's there, we experience objects. That's our conscious phenomenology. But when the brain uses predictions to control and regulate, we experience how well or how badly that control is going. So this means that our ex basic background experience of being me is really to do with how the brain is using predictions to control and regulate, to keep itself alive. And if we take this idea all the way through, we can start to see that all of our conscious experiences, since they all depend on these same principles of prediction all stem from this fundamental drive to stay alive that we all have. So consciousness and life are not just analogous in how we treat them with the tools of science. Uh, conscious experiences of world and self are fundamentally interwoven with the very fabric of being alive. 
Now, let me bring things together step by step. What we consciously perceive in the world, well, that's just the brain's best guess of the causes of sensory signals. The rubber hand illusion tells us that experiences of what is and what is not our body is just another kind of best guess. These self-related predictions depend critically on signals coming from deep inside the body, and our basic background experience of being a conscious self is more to do with control and regulation than with figuring out um, what's there in the world. So our experiences of the world and of the self are both kinds of controlled hallucinations which have been designed by evolution over millions of years to keep us alive in worlds full of danger and opportunity. Now I'll finish with three implications of all this. The first one has to do with psychiatry. Uh, if we can misperceive the world, we can also misperceive ourselves when the predictive mechanisms of perception go wrong. And this is what I'm, I'm really excited about in our research down at Sussex, because understanding this opens many important, powerful new avenues for treating psychiatric disorders, because we can finally get at the mechanisms rather than just treating the symptoms in a whole range of psychiatric conditions. These are some of the ones that we're working on at the Sackler Center. Um, you know, if you like, we can begin to get beyond just having painkillers towards having something like antibiotics for psychiatric conditions. The second implication is that our conscious experiences are so bound up in this fundamental biological drive to stay alive that it doesn't really make so much sense to think that what it is to be me could be uploaded to or reduced to a software program running on an advanced robot, however sophisticated. We are flesh and blood animals and our conscious lives depend fundamentally on that, on that fact. Just making computers smarter is not going to make them sentient and intelligence and awareness are not the same thing. And finally, our individual way of being conscious is just one point in a vast space of possible consciousnesses. And even human self generally is a tiny region in a vast space of possible ways of existing, of having subjective experiences of self and world. You know, the way each of us experience our world is distinctive, but they also share common biological mechanisms with all other living creatures. Now, these are major changes in how we understand um, ourselves, but they should be celebrated, whether it's Copernicus, we're not at the center of the universe, to Darwin, we um, are related to all other animals, to the present day, with this greater understanding comes, a, for me anyway, a greater sense of wonder and a greater realization that we are part of and not apart from the rest of nature. And when the end of consciousness comes, as the author Julian Barnes put it very beautifully, well, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing at all. Thank you very much. <laughs>